Welcome to the Classroom Podcast, the book club discussion on the classic political philosophy. My name is Eric Nganyange. I'm your host and the student in this class, sitting here with the one and only Professor Ron Klein. <laughs> Professor? Eric, how you feeling? Tired. Too much hard work. <laughs> how about you? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored, and I'm ready for this thing, man. Euthyphro. Yes. I got a few lines here I want to start it off with. Please. And then we're going to get into it. Good. If you had no clear knowledge of piety and impiety, you would never have ventured to prosecute your old father for murder. That was Socrates telling Euthyphro at the end of the, close to the end of the dialogue. So this is the conversation between two men, Socrates and the man named Euthyphro. Correct. They met outside the courthouse, or was that at the, on their way to the courthouse? Euthyphro was on his way to a, an office in the Agora of Athens, and Socrates was coming from that office, so they intersected. And that office is the one that is responsible for dealing with the process for the crimes of murder and in general, religious crimes. And, mm. and murder was considered to be actually a religious crime because a murder in the city pollutes the city, oh. right? And so until that's cleared up, the city's out of favor with the gods. So Socrates is coming out, and he's found out what the charge is going to be against him for mm. his trial. So he's just found out who's making the charge, and Euthyphro's coming Charge his father with murder. And that's, that's where basically kind of the conversation started. Because now Socrates, being the man he is, he was interested to learn something from Euthyphro about the conversation that we're going to be having. Now, according to my translation here, Euthyphro was kind of a professional priest. We don't have that category of what he was anymore. In the ancient world, they were called seers. Mm. which we would think of as prophet, somebody who see the future. But it was more than that. It's somebody who's really knowledgeable about religious issues, particularly humans' relationship with their gods. With God. Yep. So Euthyphro is, is going to charge his father for murder. Mm-hmm. The, what happened there was how seven and a slave that got into fight. Slaves was murdered, and Euthyphro's father was upset about that, so he caught the guy, this, the house servant who did that, tie him up, and throw him in a ditch. Exactly. Then he sent somebody to town to find a priest to, to figure out what to do with this guy in the ditch. Exactly. And there. through that time, the guy in the ditch died. Yeah, and we have to remember that that all happened on an island out in the Aegean. I think it was Naxos. So the time he had to send the guy, but he had to, by ship, get over to Athens and from Ap- Athens to the head of a person in the government who explained religious issues to people. It's called an exegete. And he had to get that message, and he, you know, he maybe couldn't have got it right away, and then he's got to go back to the harbor and catch a boat and take the boat back to Naxos. So you can see how it would have taken oh. m- more than a slight period of time. Interesting. So you're laying in a ditch all tied up with nothing to eat or drink for, say, a week. Well, you'll die in three days with no water. Yeah. So, so this guy died, and Euthyphro think his father is responsible for that. I mean, he tied him up and threw him in the ditch. Right. But back then, that was, you don't take your father to court. Yeah, it's a question of what's more important, family ties or community ties. And ancient Greeks tended to lean towards family, you know, in the same way that the ancient Chinese did, remember yeah. Confucius. So in most Greek families, they never would have charged the father in this case. Oh, wow. and, and, you know, Socrates expresses great surprise that he's doing this. Let's talk about Euthyphro. Who was this guy? He had to be important enough or the guy who knows this thing about piety. That's why Socrates wanted to talk to him. Well, that's a more interesting question than you might think because historians cannot find any evidence for this guy. 
97% or something like that of all the characters in the dialogues were based on actual historical figures in Athens, mm -hmm. right? And so historians can track down information about those people, sometimes lots of information. Mm -hmm. But for Euthyphro, they can find nothing. So wow. he may be one of the few characters that Plato made up to make up an opponent for the purpose of having somebody articulate the argument. Okay. Playwrights make up characters all the time, but Plato is playwright, by the way. Yeah. And he, he more or less avoided just manufacturing mouthpieces for certain views, but it appears in Euthyphro that he's done that. Huh. Can't be positive. But. Yeah. The, the, the main uh, question in this discussion, in this dialogue, conversation, whatever you want to call it, is what is piety? Absolutely. That is the question. Is piety the same as holiness? Somebody being holy? Would you say they're, very, they're very close. They're very it, I think it's, it'd be worthwhile just to take a quick second yeah. and say, what do we think piety is today? Because mm. we have a more general understanding. So piety is, you know, most people, if you ask them, what, do you, what, what is a pious person? Well, they go to church more or less every week, and especially on, on Easter and Christmas and maybe a couple other holy days. That's more or less the standard definition today, mm. right? Okay. So now that we've solved so, that, yeah. go back to ancient essence. So today we probably will name maybe priests, pastors, who go to Islam, maybe imams, those do we might call those like the most high? Well, those pious? are the professional pious people. Oh. But if you oh. talk about just a regular just person. Regular. Okay, I see what you're saying. Right. So, and Socrates is trying to define piety for anybody. Not just piety for you, Euthyphro. You the, say he tried to define or he tried to force everybody else to define? Same idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we should remember, in fairness to Socrates, he says, when I'm examining and questioning and talking to anybody, that's a form of me examining myself as well. So It's the most, most powerful way to do it. Exactly. In the beginning of the dialogue, Socrates was asking... Euthyphro, oh, he must have killed your relative. Why did Socrates ask that question? Or did the player try to throw us off? Well, I don't think he was in that case, although you always got to be prepared for that, as you were saying before. But if the father had killed another family member, that sort of takes it out of the arena of family compared to community, now it's inter-family killing and murder. And so there, that prohibition for making an accusation against a family member would go away because it's all in one family. And so you have both a familial interest and a community interest in it, and it's okay to prosecute. In a short, Socrates was trying to give him an excuse. An excuse to not to go forward with it. And no, an, an excuse for what he was doing, in fact, going forward. <laughs> oh. it's, it's okay if it was your family member. Okay. So that, I'm asking you, was that it? Well, Otherwise, I'm shocked. Now, Socrates wanted to know, what is piety from the man who was in prosecuting his father for impiety? But who is also a seer. Yeah, so he knows. So he know, he knows what piety is, right? So why does Socrates want to know so badly what piety is all of a oh, sudden? That's that's the question I had, Professor. Why Socrates was so hang up with the definitions? Well, he just came from the Archon Basileus and found out he was being accused that, of impiety. Mm. Right, that was the charge right. against him, and the further charge was corrupting the youth of yeah. Athens. But the way the charge is worded, it seems, the way he corrupted the youth of Athens by is by being impious, mm. right? So he wanted Euthyphro to explain to him what his piety so he can use in his own defense. Yeah, and it was even more clever than that. I mean, this is, there's humor in this dialogue, believe it or not. So he says, look, if I could be your student, you throw in your, <laughs> you could, I'll sign up and you can explain it to me. And then when I go into the courtroom, 
I'll say, well, I couldn't have committed impiety because I'm a student of that brilliant man, Euthyphro, who knows everything about piety. I wrote that as booby trap number one. Yeah, and there's more. Because then he says, well, if they don't believe me, we'll just have them bring you into court (laughs) and you can defend it. I, I, that just makes me laugh every time I read it. And then, and then if, it, if it was impious, they, they'll find you guilty and you can be punished. <laughs> he defined that uh, piety is what, I'm, what he was doing at that time. Right. He Prosecuting was, wrongdoers. Exactly. His father. Yeah, it just happened to be his father. Yeah. So, but Socrates doesn't like that definition because you mean the only thing that is... Pious is prosecuting my father if he murders somebody. That's the only case of, of piety. Or even if you take it in a more general sense, piety, generally speaking, would be always trying to correct some injustice. Mm. So, But that's a really narrow definition. So Socrates says, well, look, you know, I, I'd like you to give me a definition so that any time impiety might pop up in the world, I could recognize it. That it's not just prosecuting somebody for injustice, but maybe it's something else. So Socrates' his whole idea of give me the general definition that will fit everything about piety in there. Yeah, what he says is, I want a definition that would include all actions but only those actions that we would call piety. Piety is the name of a class of things, right? That's a group, and there's lots of different kinds. And I want you to give me a definition that includes everything in that class, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. So that's a a strict standard. Euthyphro went to the second one, Mm -hmm. and he said, piety is what is loved by the gods, and impiety is what is hated by the gods. Yes. Boy, he, he tied himself on that knot so bad. <laughs> well, most of us would find ourselves in that position, okay? So that, but that's an improved definition. Anything that's favored by the gods is pious, and anything that's not favored by the gods is impious, the favor of the gods is the important issue. So, so what Socrates complained about that? Well, he starts querying Euthyphro about stories about the gods and goddesses. Those stories, by the way, usually appear in one of or both of Homer's epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and another book by a near contemporary of Homer called Theogony, which is the history of the gods from the very beginning. So Socrates says, well, you know, some really odd things happen there. The gods often disagree and fight among themselves about things. Mm -hmm. Right. For example, just to pull one out of the Iliad, the Iliad was a story of the war between the Greeks and the Trojans. And as the, the fight began, the gods divided up into two camps. There was a bunch supporting the Trojans and a bunch supporting the Greeks. And Zeus, who was neutral, okay? Yeah. Everybody else had chosen up sides. And, you know, they even were down on the battlefield fighting and all kinds of interactions of a negative sort. That's one example. Yeah. But he could point out many. I mean, so he says, Socrates, well, they fight about things, don't they? Sure, that's the way it is. Well, so you're saying that the pious is what the gods love, oh, yeah. and impiety is what the gods don't love, but they're always quibbling about those kind of things. So what if they don't agree? Mm-hmm. So you, you would be pious with respect to some gods, and impious with respect to well, other yeah. gods, yeah. and that's contradiction. So you can't have that. So that doesn't work, Euthyphro. It's a good argument. To bring the present world into this again, it seems that in our Judeo-Christian society, we escape that argument because we don't have a multitude of gods, right? Mm. So they can't be fighting with each other. 
but we don't really quite escape it because while we have a text that explains everything, let's just focus on the Ten Commandments because everybody knows that. There's the text. This this is saying what the God loves, mm-hmm. but there's always the question of interpretation. Yes. Right? Yes. So the question is not do the gods disagree with each other, but do the interpretation of what the God said vary from person to person, different understanding? Mm. And obviously it does vary. Look at all the denominations of Christianity. Yep. How many gods did uh, ancient Greece have? A huge number. But they had what they called pantheon, and that means all the gods, but they were referring to 12 of them, the most important ones. So you get Zeus and Ares and Aphrodite and Athena and yeah. Hephaestus, you know, the 12 most important. And Sacre did not think the gods would be in agreement in every issue. No, and there's clear proof of it. It's, it's, it's all over the Iliad and the Odyssey and the theogony of Hesiod. So he has tons of evidence he could have gone on for Hours. Yeah. One, one of my favorite lines on Socrates, he was, he was telling Euthyphro, consider this. Is the pious being loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is it pious because it is being loved by the gods? It's actually a very good point. So what's he saying? If it's pious because it's loved by the gods, that means that pious is different than the gods. We just imagine that we have the rules of piety somewhere in the heavens, and the gods look at that and say, we really love that. That's wonderful stuff, and we'll call that piety. The other side of that is we are going to make these rules because we love them, and because we love them, you should love them. Uh. Okay? So it's an active and passive question, and talk about the Ten Commandments again, to put it in the question of Socrates' form, did God give the Ten Commandments to Moses because he loved those commandments? Or did he make up those commandments because he loved them? Right? Who's the initiator here? Uh, God or the commandments? Or the commandments, right? Yeah. And, and as a metaphor, metaphysical question, it's very fascinating. We can't drift off that way, I don't think. So Socrates is impo- pointing to a significant difference there. And like I said, I, when I read through that, I have to rethink it every time because you can get twisted up in the words fairly yeah. easily. So uh, I'm trying. So does God love our actions because... They are good, or be, the actions becomes good because they're loved by God. Correct. Is that the question? Yes. Huh. Oh, boy, that, that Socrates is a problem. Because we're going back to virtue. Are virtues good because God loves them, or because God made them, that's what makes it good? Right. What do you think, Professor? Oh, no fair. <laughs> Uh, as I say, it, it, here's the metaphysical issue, briefly said. Can it be that before God exists, there, these virtues have been defined in some way prior? So you have that side, and the other side is God gets here. He knows what piety or other virtues are because he's going to say what they are. Mm. Now, it's hard in our conception of the universe and everything to think that anything like the definition of virtue existed before God because we learned that God created everything. So it has to be God made them, therefore they're good. Yeah. We go back to, are you born knowing right and wrong? That's a different question and a fascinating one, and it's been argued a lot. We encountered it in our last series, you know, about law of nature. Yeah. Because when the social contract theorists are talking about the state of nature, they say it's still, it's a state of nature and they're mushrooms and don't interact or anything. But still, what governs their activity is the law of nature. Mm -hmm. 
which they do not explain very well. So that's been a question all the time. I, I always retreat to St. Thomas Aquinas on these issues, so I'll, I can give you his view, which is when God created the universe, and remember, the universe is driven by natural law. At the time he, he created the universe, using the natural laws, he simultaneously created natural law for human beings that he knows are going to come up. Yeah. But he further says, though, because human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, that means they have reason, and through reason they can discover those natural laws that God made. Okay? Mm. So that's a complex argument, but it's more coherent than most. Oh, man. Then uh, we could do a whole series okay, on that. I, I, absolutely. <laughs> but wrong and right. You're right about that. Yeah. Then through the discussion, Socrates pushed Euthyphro to redefine it again, what piety is. Mm-hmm. His fourth definition, piety is the, is the part of justice concerned with caring for the gods. Yeah, isn't that an interesting one? Notice how throughout, and I only picked it up recently, from the first definition, which says piety is what doing, doing justice to the unjust. Yeah. Right? So, and here's another case where justice is part of the definition. So there seems to be an intertwining of justice and piety, mm-hmm. that they go together. Tending the gods, that's what he says. So Socrates says, well, what does it mean to tend sheep? Well, what does a shepherd do? He looks after the welfare of the sheep, right? He protects them from the wolf attacking, and he gets them to the right pasturage as they move between winter and summer. And and generally, you know, he'll be sure that everybody's there. And doing things in the interest of the sheep so if you're tending gods, that means that you're doing something in their interest, interest, interest to their God. benefit. Yeah. And there's the problem, right? Mm-hmm. What can you do that would God. benefit a God? Yep. So it's like saying to us, do something that would help God out. He's perfect in every possible way, all powerful, all wise, all that stuff. There's nothing I can possibly do to, tend to, to make it better for him. Yeah. Euthyphro can, could not explain. Socrates kept pushing for that. What can you do for the gods? Right. Every definition Euthyphro came up with, it looks like the god is doing for you. Yeah. Socrates brings out that, especially in, in the way they worship gods in those days, the worship was a sacrificial ritual. Mm-hmm. So we are get together as community, and we will sacrifice, that is, kill and eat an animal or a bunch of animals. Yeah. But get this, when the Athenians had their big festival, they had to slaughter and butcher 240 head of cattle. Oh, wow. And divide it up in little small pieces so everybody could have one. Oh, wow. So you do that, and you, you take one piece, about six inches, of the thigh bone and wrap it in the animal's fat and throw it on the fire in the altar— and the smoke goes up, and supposedly the, the gods eat that in some sense. Mm-hmm. And then, to be sure you've done all you need to, you, you fill a special bowl with some wine and pour it on the ground. Mm. Okay? So, so it was a sacrifice of something you value. It's giving up something you value, hoping that the gods would be made happy Except so, so that when the other side of the, the contract comes up, God, I'd like you to do, well, let's pick Athena, goddess, I'd like you to do this for us. We have a battle coming up against the Spartans, so would you be sure that we win? Mm. So it's sort of, we'll offer you a bribe. That's a little harsh. I'll do, we'll do you a favor if you'll do us a favor. It's commerce between humans and gods. But God don't need a favor from you. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> but the, the theory of it was, you know, that they really valued this smoke and yeah. wine poured in the ground. So they thought it worked. 
again, let's come back to the modern world and do a comparison that is how often do athletes get together before a game and pray that God will Down help the them win, each, although that's each. changing a little. Now it's just, God, please be sure that nobody gets hurt. Mm. But it's the same idea, yeah. except you don't do anything for the gods. You just are down here asking for favors. Yeah. What do God benefit from human beings? Oh, that's a beauty of a question, right? Because, yeah. again, we, it's our belief that God has created the universe, right? Yeah. All wise, all powerful, all just, whatever other virtue you want to give them. And so... What can we say or do that would be good for you, to make you better than you are when you're already perfect? That, by definition, you can't do that, Yeah. right? Whereas he can do lots for us because we're very definitely not perfect. Mm-hmm. We're very imperfect. And any help he could give us getting more perfect would be deeply appreciated. Yeah. Right. So there's no gain for him. Because I was thinking about that when I was reading that piece. Yeah. With the with Zachary asking those questions. And I was like, what does God benefit from us? Well, we could go on to uh, uh, an expansion of Euthyphro's answer, which was, well, what the, what the gods want then really is not so much the sacrifice, but the honor and veneration yeah. of them to recognize their all-powerfulness or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as far as present day, as human beings, that's about all we have to give. But you, it's hard to argue that makes God any better. Yeah. Uh, Socrates says, uh, piety would then be, like what you just say, would then be, would then be a sort of trading skill between gods and men. Euthyphro say, trading, yes, if you prefer to call it that way. I prefer nothing unless it is true. That's his constant refrain. I only care about finding the truth for making myself known more to myself, making myself more virtuous, and holding up the God Apollo because he sent me on a mission, and that's what I have to do. Mm -hmm. So, But you're right. In every dialogue, as far as I can remember... That will be what Socrates says. I'm only trying to find the truth. If you can teach me the truth by showing me that I'm wrong and stupid, that's great. Yeah. Because that more truth. Yep, that's what I'm here for. Then he pushed Euthyphro to give him another definition. So his fifth definition, he say, uh, piety is saying and doing what is pleasing to the gods at prayer and sacrifice which you kind, you kind of touched on on the sacrifice part. The interesting thing is now we're back to the gods may have totally different views about that. And that, that's why Socrates says right after that, well, Euthyphro, we've come right back to the beginning. That's mm-hmm. basically the definition we started with. And we've gone through all these definitions, and we're back to the same place. So let's begin again, <laughs> right? And then what does Euthyphro do? Because, I mean, I think after Sacre told him what I say in the beginning, if you had no clear knowledge of piety and impiety, you will never have ventured to prosecute your old father for murder. And he wanted to start the conversation all over again. And Euthyphro was smart enough and understood it. I already tied myself in the nut for too long, and I'm thinking the crowd is getting a little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And this guy want to start all over again to embarrass me. It's the perfect time to go. Yeah. Oh, look what time it is. I've got to be at another meeting in five minutes. I'm out of here. So in, <laughs> in the end, Euthyphro could not define what holiness is or unholy, unholiness is. And Socrates could not get the general definition of it, what he wanted. Right. So I'm putting this weight on you, Professor. Go ahead. Can you define the holiness for us? I can define it in modern terms. Okay. But that's not adequate, the modern term one. I don't think even that's adequate. So I I have to, 
appeal the way Socrates appealed to his lack of ability to define things is humans don't have wisdom and can't have wisdom. That's a divine characteristic. All we can do is try to get as close as we can to understand. Mm -hmm. And I will readily admit I'm not close to understanding anything. I've thought about this issue since I was a teenager and have not advanced much, if at all. Mm. Where can we try to go to find the answer to that, the holiness? Read all the dialogues of Plato. Aristotle's probably not a lot of help, but you, you just read Summa Theological of St. Thomas Aquinas, and he'll be attacking that directly all the time. Can the church help? I think that's iffy. It's not the kind of question that comes up in like parish churches or if we went to the First Methodist Church or the Congregational Church or Trinity. You think the question of holiness is not coming? I think the question may be there, but the answers aren't. I mean, priests, pastors aren't necessarily trained a great deal to answer those kind of questions. Do we need to understand the piety in order to understand the impiety? Not necessarily. Or we need to study them side by side? Well, look at it this way. We don't need to understand fully the concept of justice to also understand that murder is wrong. Mm. You can come up with murder is wrong independently of any understanding of justice. Yeah. So it gets real complicated. Yeah, murder is is wrong. It depends on who you killed, right? Or who did the killing, yes. If If I killed them, I'm fine, and it's just. If you killed them, bad news. (laughs) Can you be pious without believing in God? Not the way the problem is set up in this dialogue. There are modern arguments that you can, which I'm not sure I believe, but there are some. Okay. Because piety is part of the virtue. Yeah, political virtue, too. Political virtue. And we could ask why it's considered a political virtue. Why? (laughs) I could ask the question. You, yeah, you, no, you, 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 you're here to answer the question. Oh, I try. Not to ask the, I try. Why, why is part of the political version? Well, if you were pious, right, you would have the kind of behavior that would be better for our community. And if everybody was pious, the whole community would be better. We would treat each other with... The, the virtues of piety, like kindness and, and, and helpfulness, and we wouldn't do impious things like kill each other off or rob each other. So like any of the other virtues, it improves the life of the community. Yeah. That's why it's a political virtue. If everybody were saintly, let's yeah. say, can you imagine how much nicer everything would be? Well, it would be nice because we wouldn't need a government. <laughs> Well, <laughs> probably. <laughs> no, because this, this idea of uh, piety is just fascinating me. Mm-hmm. And I like what you say. It's a divine thing. Yep. But we can always try to get as close as possible, but we'll never get there. Which it makes sense, because human beings are not perfect. Correct. And Socrates says all the time, I don't claim to know the answer to any of these things. And, in fact, I think it's not possible for a human being to definitively know any of those things. Just as what you said, we're fallen in many ways human beings, and we only have certain cognitive capacities anyway, and then we have all sorts of other things troubling us yeah. because life is complicated and we have an emotional roller coaster, for example, or... Tragedy happens or too much joy happens, if that's possible. And so we're never really even keeled. That's what Marcus Aurelius is trying to get us to be. But we don't achieve that, at least not for me. I can, you know, two or three nanoseconds, I might be able to handle it. But what is the purpose of the church or mosque or if it's not trying to make people holy? That's what it is. And I think it's true, I think, for any religious organization. Pick your religion. I think all of them try to provide a cosmic understanding 
of the universe we live in. in let's just take Christianity. What's the first thing is talked about? How did this world and this universe come into existence? Mm -hmm. It's a dynamite question. It's still a question. If you believe the Big Bang Theory, which has been unshaken by, we're coming up on 100 years, that the whole universe came into existence from something the size of your fist. And when I say whole universe, I mean all the material in it, space itself, and time, hmm. which is everything, basically. Yeah. And poof, there it is. It's amazing. Mm. So what, what could do that? Because that's not an accident. Yet we can't see it. We can't understand anything before that moment, which is like 14 billion years ago. Because I think earlier you said the religious institution cannot really help us to define what piety is. Not perfectly. That's mm. what I said. Not perfectly. Okay. But they can lead us to... Better. To better. They can lead it better, not perfect. Right? If you live by, say, the Ten Commandments, better. Yeah. If you could do it constantly, right? And, you know, pick any religion, and there'll be a set of rules. The idea is if you live in accordance with those rules, you'll be a better person, and the world will be a better world, and that's great for all of us. And God will be happy, too. Out of the five political virtues, most of us cannot... Uh, maintain all five of them. Which, really which, which one is the most critical, would you say, piety and justice? Well, yes, I think that's true. And remember, if we go back to Protagoras, it was very clear in Protagoras' enumeration of the political virtues that justice was the most important. Mm. He said, pass these out, and he lists the five. And, and if you... if some people won't accept being just. You have to either expel them or kill them. So, and he doesn't say that about any of the other ones, so it follows that that's the most important. Mm. And if you think of justice without going into to a lot of philosophy, it's just treating everybody fairly. Yeah. Right? And you can see why that would be the most important thing, because if people are not treating people fairly, the community breaks apart. Yeah. Would you say that justice is embedded in piety? Can you be holy without being just? I don't think so. And I think that's why he's tied them together yeah. in this. As I was saying at the beginning, that's a recent observation of mine. I've read it many times, and I never really fully grasped that he was tying the two together. I think if you got, if you got justice, you likely have achieved piety as well. You think so? Because I always think it's the other way around. If you have piety, you have justice. Well, then he would have talked about piety in the Republic oh, he, and not he, justice. You tell me all the time. He might be wrong. Hey, we, might be we, wrong. we might be right. That's correct. <laughs> or, which makes it harder on us, is he might be able to create a situation where we're looking at something we have trouble grasping and so we have to go off and think about it, and maybe we'll come up with a better answer. And just like the thing you say all the time, maybe he left it out on purpose to see if we're going to catch it and say, oh, this one is backward. Right. It should be pied in there. Right. So yeah. I, I wait with eagerness your dialogue on. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but On holiness, it's going to be two lines. Define holiness, the answer is Eric. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a sense of the, humor too. The, the, the end of good. the end of the dialogue. The end of dialogue, right? Just follow Eric. Look my Go. life, and you will you, find piety. There it is. Would you recommend this dialogue to churches or any re religious institutions? Abs absolutely, I think they all should all study it. Because mm. I was thinking about that when I was reading. That's a good thought. I was like, I wonder if this can be recommended to the religious institution because. There's very interesting questions in there Socrates asking, or is pointed out. And they're timeless questions. Well, Professor, anything else you want to add on this guy, on this dialogue? I think we covered the waterfront pretty well. Yeah. Some of these issues will bubble to the surface We're, in other dialogues, so we oh, might, yeah, may have a chance, or we may hit it in our... Oh, I wish we'd have talked about that series. I know, I know. <laughs> I, think, I think some of this stuff will keep popping up. Which is good. Yeah, because I, I, I need... 
I keep thinking about how to become holy. So you got work to do, my friend. <laughs> I couldn't resist, Eric. I'm just, I'm just joking, everybody. No, he's not. <laughs> well, thanks, Professor. Thank you, Eric. Yep. <laughs>